So at this point, we will be doing a panel discussion. So I will be adding Martina here and also inviting Emily Hamilton to come back as well. Is Emily here? Emily is here. She's slow, <laughs> but she's here. <laughs> Hi, friends. How are you? Good. You're almost, you're almost uh, to your weekend. Um, so I, I, uh, I think I'm going to kick this off. And it's my pleasure to say and also disclose that while there was one form of discipline in preparing my remarks and not preparing my remarks before I sat and listened this week, um, there was a very different logic to engaging with what this conference was about. And when the organizers asked me to participate, I asked if we could have regular check-ins for six months leading up to the process because there's an incredibly interesting story around the meta of a conference. And I think so many th lessons are learned as we, um, as we have seen over the course of the week in the process of building something, whether it be a 3D object or whether it be a gathering of people to talk about issues. And so um, I have journaled this team's process in planning. And um, we have talked a lot about some of the issues that underpin how this conference was shaped. And I, the questions that I posed to them, I would say, um, I actually extend them to the entire audience here, to everybody listening in. These are questions I would be personally interested to know the answers to. And I wonder if AIC, FAIC and the organizers of Tech Focus 4 would also um, like to know them. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it off and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna ask us to go in alphabetical order. So Alex, with, without putting you on the spot, if, if, um, if, if you could kick us off. Um, as you know, I, had, I did have the up close view on what's been going on with this gathering. And, and as I just mentioned to everybody, I've been keeping lots of notes. Um, and if anything in these last few days, we've seen that there are many, many important pressing questions and current concerns regarding 3D printing. But why is this conference important to you? Well, contemporary art is so challenging and so exciting and fun to work with. And it's impossible for one conservator to be an expert in everything that artists are working in. So I was really hoping through this conference, a personal goal of mine was to provide a kind of framework uh, that other conservators who were attending this now have a little bit more knowledge about what kinds of questions to ask or how to approach the issues that may be faced in stewarding the care for 3D printed artworks and files, and also working with external vendors to get what is needed for exhibition. Because truly with a lot of artworks in general, but especially with contemporary art, um, exhibition is the way to keep these artworks alive. Thanks, Alex. Emily? Well, one thing that comes to my mind is that the nature of our work with objects is responsive. So we are charged first with, with dealing things that are collected and then going back a step beyond that, that are, that are made. And in this situation, there's this whole world of development that's happening in industry. And there's a little bit of a delay from then what artists will choose to use and then what um, what a curator might choose to collect. And I was very, very keenly interested in learning more about what's in the pipeline, what, what should we be expecting and learning from other institutions about how they're um, already engaging in this, this very new technology. So mm. that was my thought. Thank you. Martina. Well, I uh, I had to go through, I think a much darker, much darker valley and answering the question why is a why is a conference on three D printed art important while the planet is heating up and the water levels are rising and we're talking about recreating pieces of plastic and creating more plastic. So uh, I've been uh, quite, quite grappling with this question. Um, and then, and then you listen to 
a talk by Virginia Sanfratello, who's talking to us about how she's taking all these rubber pieces and collecting all the all the wooden chips that other people want to get rid of and she creates these like new pieces of art and inspires us actually by by making these works to look at or or to make us reflect on the the part that we can take in um uh fighting the climate change and uh and i'm you know and i'm we're hearing about shelly t's work this morning and there are these really beautiful works that just go so far beyond the material and they they uh, they move us and they make us feel things so that's that's how i found that's how i found back out of this dark valley and uh, just looking at these yeah beautiful works that that uh, make us human and distinguish us from just um, yeah, non-human beings. So, thank you. You know, I, I'm going to stick with you, Martina, in in maybe asking a bit of a follow up, and then ask Emily and and Alex to join in. But you know, there's in your response, there's something about um, the, ref the the internal reflection that goes on in the practices of conservation. And something that also continues to underpin outdoor, outward exploration of the materials and the objects that are being created by artists and designers. And, and I'd love to ask you to reflect a little bit on how in 2021, that toggling between the internal reflection and the rapid fire techno technological advances sort of maps in your head and in your, in your life. Do you mean do you mean how how can we as conservatives sort of preserve this 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 radicality that these objects deliver? If that's where it takes you, go for it. If that's where it takes you, I'm really sort of thinking about the way oh, that you balance. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Oh, um, oh my internet connection is not good. Um, um, you know, I um, I don't know if we I don't know if we can preserve the radicality of these of these objects since that is so, in my opinion, so tied to this to this one moment in time that, like we today, we don't know the radicality that a VHS video recorder had. I mean, I remember it because I went through that process as having one at some point. Um, uh, so I I don't know I've I've been wondering that too often with the uh, performance pieces and performance art whether whether we are able to to conserve that context that 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 people or or um, yeah visitors or, or, or anybody experiencing a certain artwork in a certain time frame whether we we cannot preserve that time frame I think um, we can talk about it we can you know document it but this this uh, this very um heartfelt gut experience i think that is something that is maybe not conservable and and with the radicality of this technology i mean i think it will it will move on and and maybe it will get even more radical um but i don't know if if uh if a, a 3d print that that has a very low resolution will be uh, very radical in five years. But I'm curious what other people are thinking about that. Mm -hmm. If I can jump in, I feel like that ties to what you said in your talk, Jill, about how do we meet artists where they are as an overall charge? How do we meet artists where they are um, in order to, you know, to understand the sense of radicality in a time and in what their goals are in their project? And a point that came up in one of our earlier conversations is, is what are what are the limitations of our empathy in doing so? Is that is that a tool of conservation in order to understand what the works are? Um, so that's one thing I went back to. Mm. 
Okay. You know, you're, you're making me think of, sorry, Alex, one second, I just wanted to add something to that. You're making me think about another thing that, that could be considered, and that is these boundaries that we create between disciplines. And I'm not thinking about curators and conservators right now, I'm thinking about art and science. You know, science is a word that was made up in the 19th century. It's not, it's, it's an, it's a word that was, that was, I think, so there's a sign, there's a, there was somebody at Oxford who came up with the term. And I, I find that to be really interesting because you proposed, like maybe some of the radicality of these works is in starting to tell the stories of the science that's been going on and art museums being places that tell the stories of the science and the developments um, messes with the categories of learning that we have inherited um, in kind of a radical way or two. <laughs> so, Alex, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No worries. I actually took a question slightly, I interpreted it slightly differently. So what, what it brought up to me is I was thinking about the last two years Everyone I'm sure here can uh, relate to the immense amount of stress and uh, the really uh, the realization that we, we probably need to have better boundaries between our personal life and our work life um, and all of the work that's been put up upon us. And I was thinking a lot about how when you really dig down into these types of artworks, there's really a myth out there that they, they're like rapid prototypes that you could just push a button and it goes. But really you have to think about the network of different people that are there, the technology that's around, what kinds of other practices are done. I mean, we heard a lot, from, I mean, especially with Peter and Megan in their talk today when they discussed just all the work that went into reprinting that piece and then in the end finding that there are like pink dots on it. And uh, Michelle Barger also brought up the idea of like these hitting costs and how that also affects exactly like what gets displayed and what makes it through. So I thought a little bit more about kind of the, the, the kind of, um, I guess the, the, not the stresses, but the amount of work that is then put upon those in the museum environment, if we are to then commit to uh, preserving and reprinting these works. Mm. Thank you. I'm going to stick with you, Alex, on this and, and sort of imagine that, you know, this, this extraordinary fourth in a series, let's hope there's five. I don't know, is it already, have you already named the topic? Um, but uh, Too soon, Jill, too soon. Okay. Not, not <laughs> us, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the 25th mile in the marathon, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think is it, I think as, as you all, not so much what happened today or Wednesday or Monday, but really as the organizers of this conference, um, FAIC or AIC says, what are some of the biggest concerns that you have about 3D printing? What, what might be some of the answers that you would, that you would report back? Um, the answers to that or the answers that 3D printing can possibly fix? Oh, I was thinking of AIC's, you know, challenges to conservation but I, I mean take it in both directions. I, I actually think that there potentially are some really interesting environmental impacts that can be fixed with 3D printing if it is truly about the concept and about you know the files or the artwork and then that's just an output that is then shown in a similar way that sometimes in photography we have exhibition prints or if there's uh, things that are meant to be destroyed after the end of the display there is a potential to save a lot of you know, um, carbon, I'm just thinking about carbon offsetting, and uh, a lot of uh, stress on the environment by not having to ship things around the world. And also in making different artworks accessible to a lot of different parts of the world that may not have a large budget to ship original objects. Mm -hmm. So there is a possibility there. I don't really have the answers for what kind of answers we have here because I think everything's so complex. It's something that makes life so interesting. Mm. Emily Martina, any thoughts on that? I don't know if it's necessarily a challenge, but it's it's been really interesting to hear people's kind of offhand 
um, expectations and then frustrations with expectations for this technology. Like I am thinking of Paola Antonelli saying that she thought by now 3D printers would be on every corner and you know everything would be super accessible. And so it's, I almost feel like one of the challenges is, um, is, is like getting our, our minds to accept what the technology can do and um, and how it it can be used versus like this idea that it'll fix everything. I don't I don't know, but that's that's where my mind goes. Mm -hmm. Martina, well, I think I, I want to go to to um, the, maybe the other direction that your question had in in petto, and uh, um, and I. I'm recalling that uh, Tatiana Cole posted in the chat at some point where she asked, hey, can we just look at contemporary photography and, and make comparisons and, and sort of look at the practice of contemporary uh, photographers reprinting their works? And, um, and, and I have to admit that I, I went into this project or this conference uh, uh, with my background in media conservation where you're you know, very quickly create an exhibition copy and you have a master and, and you just sort of export something. And uh, um, and of course, even in this sphere, you have your criteria of quality and, uh, and you're staying true to the installation instructions, but uh, it, it comes much, you know, I would say maybe to, to the notion that there is a master living in a different sphere and then creating something that is then accessible in the galleries is not that far, far away. Um, and uh, and I'm, I, I don't know, I have not spoken with Peter about that, but I, I, would, I would assume that him going into the reprinting of the Tauber Hour back was, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't speak for Peter here, um, but I could imagine that this, this would, was a, a very similar, like, oh, well, we'll just send it out to the printer and, um, and, and have, have another copy being made or have, or have it being reprinted. And then seeing the hoops that go into that and then changing that, well, I think we should try to conserve the objects as much as possible. So anyways, this was my, I'm, I think I'm only sharing the, the shift that I've, I underwent uh, going, you know, listening to everybody's talks, preparing for this conference um, that, yeah, it, it, it may be a viable um, preservation strategy to reprint, but it should not be a first go-to, um, yeah. Mm. Thank you, thank you. I think we wanted to make time, and I'm, I'm conscious that we're seven minutes to the hour when you were hoping, I think, to wrap up, but I'm conscious that we wanted to at least leave a little space for questions from our participants. Um, and I don't know if there are any, I'm not good at doing three things at once here. Um, there, but, there, are, there are none yet, but if people want to, we're monitoring the chat and the Q&A, um, if anybody wants to join this conversation. How was it for you, Jill? How have you been? I mean, you've given us so such deep reflection on this on this conference. But uh, if I may ask you back, what is your how how do you feel about reprinting? And uh, so so I can't help anymore, as you know, um, thinking about the specifics um, of objects, but also going very high in altitude and really thinking about the larger infrastructures that we've made for culture. And so I feel so strongly that what we do in conservation is really much part of a much larger sector, a much larger sector, and we're all interconnected. So the idea that we can somehow marshal change in a sequestered space that is just conservation feels impossible to me. And I, and so I'm, really struck by that. But I guess the other reflection that I would share with you, which is a, maybe it's a COVID, maybe it's a post pandemic, maybe it's a, you know, somehow there's a threshold um, for me. And that is that I spent so much of my life operating in this field for an institution, for one institution. 
And I've come now that I operate independently to understand how much that institutional culture influences the way work is done, but also what the possibilities are. And, and so it, I use that not, um, I mean, I believe in institutions. I believe in machines that, that do this work. I'm, I'm really steadfast in that, but I've really come to live this idea of how interconnected um, our methods of conservation are because they are not neutral across even institutions. And there are financial constraints, there are different cultural constraints, there are any number of issues that influence the way that we proceed with, with a treatment. So um, I'm really, really looking at those issues. And I think I, I think I spoke my mind when I sort of said, uh, what an extraordinary opportunity to feel hopeful in the presence of people who are using these technologies right now and the way that they're applying them. And I'd love to see our field respond in kind. I would really love to see our field sort of take that as almost a challenge um, and think about the ways that we would retool or maybe even just refresh um, how we go about doing our work in these very heady and, and, and urgent times for the planet. Any other thoughts or questions? There is a question, a comment in the Q&A here. So Michelle says, this is more of a comment. It seems to me that early 3D printed works that came into the SF MoMA collection almost two decades ago had much less post-production. And I feel that informed our initial thoughts about the possibility of, rep of reprinting as a preservation plan. It seems that artists are now manipulating the method and the materials in new ways that make reprinting a much more challenging preservation solution. Yes, I definitely agree with this. I think it's almost in a way, you know, Sarah Scutero also mentioned this as well, that the fashion designers that you're working with, you see this final polished product and it looks one way and it looks so like, I mean, the example that she was saying was that it looks really futuristic, but then when you look down to it, there is actually more of that traditional construction. And I think a lot towards, uh, you know, some of the methods that Megan was also mentioning with her experience working in a foundry of how the finisher can make or break the object. And that's something that I, could definitely see uh, when looking at more modern prints versus earlier prints that maybe didn't have quite as much polish to them. And I do feel like industry has evolved like just enough where people will will know what the common things are. Like Tobias mentioned, you know, just uh, with SLS, white prints always yellow, and people know that. And now there's other other colors you can print in where that's less of an issue. So I feel like. The, um, I feel like I go back to Charlotte Eng's, um, Charlotte Eng's yeah, um, comment that um, industry is on top of this and will resolve some of the common issues as these do kind of become more, more products. Emily, I think you made a comment the other day in one of our conversations about how you visited a, you visited a, a printing studio and you were struck and remember, or like realized it really hit you that this is a multi-billion dollar industry and we're just looking at a tiny little fraction of it. I am, um, the, the early days of, some, of a new industry are exciting times and really interesting to remember. And, and you know, I remember pre-Java what it was like to do coding, right? So, but not so, and then there were tools that were developed, or I remember a curator of photography thinking about photography in the early digital printing realm. Um, and he described the early days as giving a 13 year old an electric guitar. You know what I mean? It's just, it just it's, it's going through a stage of growth that, um, that ultimately will not be there, but it's really interesting to watch. Well, we've, uh, we've reached the, the hour and I, I was wondering whether this is a good moment to sort of close this 
these, this, this week of uh, talking and considering and uh, uh, rethinking and re reordering our thoughts around these works uh, of art. Thank Jill. you. No, Jill, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, not just your incredible reflection that you did today, but thank you also for the many hours that you've spent talking to us and discussing with us and uh, journaling uh, the our <laughs> our thoughts and our conversations. And um, thank you for. Uh, joining us on this journey. It was uh, such a pleasure. My pleasure, thanks so much. Um, and uh, I know that uh, there's, a, there's a mirror board. <laughs> I'm hoping everybody puts a dot in the, we wanna send this around at the end of, um, well, at some point we wanna send this around. So if you have not placed your dot yet, that would be cool. Um, and uh, I also know that Sarah wants to say a few things before we head out. Uh, but before that, I want to say uh, thank you to all our speakers. Uh, thank you for the incredible talks. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you for asking questions and, and partaking in this conversation. Thank you to my co-organizers, Alex. Thank you for being the trooper that you were. Thank you, Emily. For, for the for the journey and uh, I don't know Alex do you want to say a few more things I think you took the words out of my mouth um, <laughs> thank you to everyone who's really spent these this whole week with us uh, exploring and learning more and I'm, I'm really hoping that this uh, moves forward where there's a little bit more of a, a global network where people can discuss a lot of these uh, issues and questions and uh, otherwise, very much looking forward to the IPI's research. It'll be really great to see what they come up with as well. 